Right, hello. Um, I'm Nikki Padfield and I'm speaking to you from my rather scruffy study in Cambridge. And we're gathered together to discuss criminal justice in a pandemic. I have to say that the University of Cambridge has never felt to me like an ivory tower. And we academics have not, I think, traditionally felt ourselves to be isolated. But th at this time, I certainly have felt out of touch. It's been really difficult for someone like me and probably someone like most of you in the audience to know what's really going on. So I am fantastically grateful to the panelists who joined us today, who are going to help us understand some of these very difficult questions related to criminal justice in a pandemic. Thank you for the hundreds of you who I can't see who have, I think, joined us from all around the world, mostly alumni of the University of Cambridge. And we're very, very pleased to have you joining us today. I'd like to start, before I introduce the panel and thank the panel, I'd also like to thank um, two hidden colleagues, one of whom is Dan Bates for his amazing IT support and the other is Claire Gordon, our development whiz in the faculty, who's also a barrister and concerned, as we all are, about the meaning of criminal justice in the COVID-19 pandemic. Today our focus is the courts, exploring the reality, I hope, of daily life in magistrates' courts and in the Crown Court, from bail applications to sentencing what is going on at the coalface, what has happened to trials, what will happen to trials in the future. There are many, many questions which we will be addressing. I'm, as I say, really, really grateful for this fabulous team who are going to speak. In alphabetical order, they are Simon Davis, president of the Law Society and a partner at Clifford Chance. Then we have Avimbola Johnson, barrister practicing from 25 Bedford Row in London. Ian Kelsey, solicitor advocate, head of crime at Kelsey and Hall in Bristol. Amanda, P Amanda Pinto QC, chair of the Bar Council, who practices largely in international crime from 33 Chancery Lane. What I ask the panelists to do is each to speak for just four minutes depending on the muting that goes on, whether I can shout loudly to shut them up after their four minutes or whether they are reliable timekeepers, time will show. Um, but I've asked them just to speak for four minutes each. I think we'll go from one to the next and then that on my mathematics should last significantly less than half an hour. And the questions will be really interesting. Feel very free to chat, to have your own opinions on the chat. I'll be taking the questions, though, from the Q&A column. So any questions that you'd like to put to the panel, choose your panelists that you want to ask questions to if you want. Um, please use the Q&A button for your questions for the panel. The order that I've chosen is to start with Ian, since... Um, his work, of course, starts in the police stations, and that seems to be a good place to start. We'll go from Ian, and then to Abby, and then to Amanda, and then finally Simon. And so straight away, do feel free to log your questions as we go through, but we'll turn straight away to Ian, and you've got four minutes. Thank, Thank you me. hugely Thank for you. being here. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I think the pandemic's shown an amazing ability of those agencies within the criminal justice system in the main to work together, and particularly in police stations. We found from the outset there was a bit of resistance from the police, but we made it plain we weren't prepared to travel to police stations. We wanted to keep our staff safe. We wanted to remain safe. And... Um, eventually we've managed to get to a system where most interviews are now being conducted over Skype, where we beam into the police station and the police have been very good about that. Some forces not so good. It's interesting how over the course of the 
uh, pandemic since it started, how some forces have been brought to heel much more quickly than others. Uh, in Bristol, my own force, Avon and Somerset, were very, very good, um, but they did require a little bit of persuasion at the outset, and that persuasion was none of us are going to the police station, so what are you going to do about it? Um, and the end result was they realised they had to do something about it, otherwise they would be conducting interviews which would be in breach of pace. Um, but it, it did bring about a degree of consideration and thoughtfulness that came then into the magistrate's court, um, and we found that the cooperation there, we're dealing with most hearings in the magistrates' courts. The only hearings really are those overnight prisoners. Again, they're being dealt with by Skype. Um, the HMCTS representative who took on responsibility for arranging this in uh, Bristol uh, was absolutely first class. The police have been absolutely first class and our district judge has been first class. So we've managed to arrange a situation where we conduct pretty well all the magistrates' court hearings from the safety of our offices or home, making bail applications, et cetera, beaming into court. So I think we've learned a fair bit through the pandemic. I'm not saying it's ideal. We do get, uh, we do get reasonable contact with the client. We're able to speak to them sensibly and able to speak to them over Skype. Um, but I don't think there's anything that substitutes for the real thing when if you can actually be next to the client and with them, it's much better than being over the video link. But on the other hand, when you balance safety, as we've had to do over the course of the past uh, couple of months, then I think we've achieved a situation that's as good as we could possibly hope to achieve. Um, I don't know whether there's anything else you want me to talk about. The, I can talk about the Crown Court from our perspective as well. Bristol is one of the first courts that had jury trials, that, the first jury trial, a murder trial, involving a youth ended yesterday. Um, I was sat in my office and I, it was clearly an acquittal because I heard the whoops of delight from outside and the, I saw the uh, young, de young detainee who had been charged with murder walking free from court. Um, I went across to the Crown Court and saw it. It's worked very well. We've ended up with using four court, uh, three courts for the trial, uh, one court for the jury deliberations and congregation, the second court for the press and the public. The trial was then in, in that court was video linked in, uh, slight problems with sound, but not too bad. And then the main court, the jury were in the main court, socially distanced all the way around the court. Uh, and it seemed to work very well. I spoke to everybody concerned and they were very happy with the process. So that, I think, is where we're going to be moving to thereafter with trials moving forward. I, I, the only point I would make is it will be a trickle of trials. It will not be a stream or anything like a tsunami. It will be a long time before we get back to normal, I fear. Thank you very much indeed. That was an interesting introduction. Um, I'm sure we'll come back later on to what you called reasonable contact in the police station, because reasonable is a wonderful word, is it not? And whether all um, suspects also think they've had reasonable contact, we perhaps will discover in due course. But that was a really interesting start. Thank you. Abby, straight over to you. Thanks. Um, I think what I'd like to talk about really is just sort of the overall themes that we've seen from the way that the pandemic has affected the criminal justice system. Um, I think the criminal justice system is a pretty precise barometer for the state of inequality and injustice within our societal structure. And for me, the way that the pandemic has hit the system, it's really highlighted all of the weaknesses and the issues that we were already creaking along with due to being woefully underfunded. And that in turn has highlighted these wider societal issues that we're battling with as a country. Um, to see that we can just trace what's happened with the Coronavirus Act and its sister regulations during lockdown. But they are wide ranging pieces of legislation that create a swathe of new offences. And they were passed with very little oversight or explanation. They've really paved the way for a huge amount of wrongful convictions under the Act. Uh, we saw that there was a CPS review, the results of which were announced around the 14th of May, 
that revealed that 44 charges were brought under the Act, which were wrong, all of them were wrong, and that 13 resulted in wrongful convictions. And we would have seen, all of us, um, in the newspapers, the case of Marie Deneau, uh, who caught the attention of Faria Karim, who was a Times journalist, and Kirsty Brimlow QC. Uh, Ms Deneau was charged, arrested, um, charged with an offence under Schedule 21 of the Act. She spent two nights in custody before being produced to court. She was unrepresented in the magistrate's court without any evidence being called. She was convicted and she was fined all in her absence. And the fact that that happened, it's not simply because of the pandemic, the groundwork for that wrongful conviction, really that was laid through years of emphasis in the court system and in the magistrate's court in particular, on speedy summary results at the expense of justice. It was laid through the attrition of access to representation, uh, which means that we are becoming too used to convicting defendants without them having anybody on their side. And I think that the act and the pandemic, certainly it's added to the hasty way in which she was convicted. Uh, but that's because of this history of the attrition of personhood that we've seen within the system. Uh, that emphasis on getting a result quickly meant that no one from the police, the CPS or the district judge spotted the fact that she was wrongly charged. And Kirsty Brimlow herself said that it only took a quick review for her to spot that error. And I think it highlights also a wider concern about the needs to ensure that the public and the media remain engaged with the criminal justice system to ensure that the players within the system are held accountable, that they continue to maintain a system that seem to be fair as well as actually being fair. Because you wonder whether if the public gallery were full, if the players in that courtroom would have questioned what's happening, would have thought, well, maybe we shouldn't proceed with this so quickly. She's not in court. She hasn't said anything. Um, she didn't speak, actually. She didn't speak from the moment that she was arrested through to her conviction. So a concern that I have about the legacy of the pandemic is that it's really pushing us towards rushed results and potentially unfair outcomes. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we had a backlog of 37,000 cases because of reduced court sittings due to that lack of funding. And that's only going to be massively increased by the end of lockdown. So I worry about how these cases, this backlog is going to be pushed through the system in an effort to clear it. And I hope uh, that this pushes the government towards recognising that the only way to fight through this pandemic is to put money into the system to make sure that we are not creating a legacy that continues this attrition of personhood and participation within the system. Thank you very much indeed. There we have questions of inequality, public engagement, speedy justice, um, fears for the future, and um, I'm sure that you've raised lots of things which we will come back to in due course. Thank you very much indeed. And on to you, Amanda, for your insights. Hello, well, thank you very much. Um, I thought I'd start by asking, what does access to justice for the public mean? Um, it means, I think, regardless of your wealth or circumstances, regardless of where you live, who you are, or what problem you face, you can use the justice system effectively. And before the crisis, that meant we needed to consider basics, courts that were open, close enough to be accessible, justice delivered by judges without inordinate delays. And Abby's just spoken about the 37,000 uh, cases in the backlog in crime alone before the pandemic. Uh, listing cases realistically so that citizens don't pay or have to turn up. Uh, unnecessarily for ineffective hearings, uh, a justice system that uses technology uh, wisely and suitably, and a judiciary that is valued and supported. And of course, it includes appropriate legal help for all. But before COVID-19, fewer and fewer people with legal problems had access to legal aid, and litigants in person uh, were confronted by real problems identifying the strengths and weaknesses of their cases and causing enormous stress and delay across the system. So that was the background uh, against which we must ask the questions uh, that Nikki has posed. We know that the cases uh, adding to the backlog are adding at the rate of a thousand a month in crime alone. 
uh, and in civil, we know that they are mounting too. Um, what is the long-term effect of the backlog of cases? Well, there is no infrastructure, we say, to deal with that backlog unless the legal professions, uh, as well as the rest of the criminal justice system, has investment in it now. Um, with, even with jury trials restarting, uh, that things won't be returning to the same level of hearings pre-COVID. Um, the Institute for Government's recent report shows that in the Crown Court, of course, the volume of jury trials fell by 100% in April. It's only just started again. Uh, but it cannot be more than a third of the maximum if three courts are being used for every trial. And in fact, it will be less because of the capacity of court uh, rooms to hear with social distancing. Uh, but if that were the case, uh, with Crown Court volumes, even with remote hearings, it's not going to be possible, we think, uh, according to the Institute for Government's report, for more than 50 or perhaps 80 percent at the very best after six months of uh, court hearings to be heard. And that doesn't just mean trials, it means all hearings. And so that means that defendants and victims will be forced to wait more than six months for a trial longer, the highest average waiting list ever recorded. You might hear government officials say, well, we've had bigger backlogs before, but we've never had bigger backlogs uh, with this really significant uncertainty going forward. Uh, secondly, I think there is a real problem with legal aid. Uh, just before the pandemic, the Criminal Legal Aid Review, which was started last year, uh, in which the government acknowledged the significant underfunding of the criminal justice system, the consultation on the accelerated areas for uh, barristers and solicitors uh, was out and about to close. So that meant that we were about to we thought get uh, more money for the professions and therefore more access to justice for individuals. Um, that's on hold at the moment. We're hoping that that will be uh, reinvigorated very quickly because really we need to work towards long-term sustainability of the professions uh, in order for the public to have access to justice. And can I just uh, finish on a negative note before adding three positives? Uh, I'm afraid to say that those who have been most seriously hit uh, by the pandemic at the bar, according to our surveys, are those doing publicly funded work and even worse figures for BAME and those uh, who have um, come from uh, unusual or, or non-traditional backgrounds. And if I can just add some statistics, the impact on the bar is that 69% of those doing publicly funded work cannot survive for six months. That's until October uh, without a financial assistance. Uh, but for BAME uh, and uh, those with social mobility, uh, that if they are doubly hit. They're more likely to be doing publicly funded work. They're more likely to face greater financial pressures. Uh, and uh, our statistics show that 84% of BAME barristers do not believe they'll be able to survive a year without financial aid. Uh, and uh, I, I think that that is a very serious issue for the future, not just of the bar, but of the senior judiciary, because of course the bar is a feeder for that. C can I just add a, a couple of positives? Technology has come on in leaps and bounds. What should have been rolled out in the courts in two years has been really rolled out to an extraordinary degree in 10 weeks. Obviously, adaptations need to be made. Obviously, it's not a panacea to all the problems, but I think it will have a significant positive impact if used wisely uh, and uh, properly uh, on the delivery of justice across the board, including criminal justice. And secondly, to echo what Ian said at the very beginning, uh, the question uh, that has was raised really in in uh, in a silent way at the beginning, uh, but which has been answered hugely positively, uh, is the ability and the willingness of agencies right across the criminal justice system to work together collaboratively. And I think without any one of those parts, it would not have worked. And that is why there needs to be investment right across the board from the very beginning in policing to the very end in prison and probation. 
and every single step along the way in order that everybody involved in the criminal justice system in whichever position, whether as a defendant, a witness or a victim, they all have uh, access to justice through this system being supported from start to finish. Thank you very much indeed. So huge concerns about access to justice, legal aid, delays, but some positives in relation to the use of technology and collaboration. Simon. Thank you very much, Nikki. I'm perhaps in the, the fortunate position is that I'm not a criminal uh, practitioner, but I'm also in the fortunate position that I therefore do a great deal of listening to everybody who is involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, coming last, it's always going to be difficult to avoid going over some of the old ground, uh, most particularly in circumstances where my predecessor was Amanda Pinto, because she and I speak almost every single moment of the day. Uh, likewise, Ian Kelsey, in relation to his position as co-head of the Law Society Criminal Law uh, Committee. Uh, and the piece, therefore, I'm going to overlap on very slightly is this question about access to justice and what is this all actually about? Because sometimes that gets lost in a welter of statistics and data. So let me make that point good when I was asked to be interviewed by ITV Granada, pre-recorded last week. And I was expecting, and I'd been told that I was going to be asked about what courts are open, what kind of business is being done, what's the impact and so on and so on. Absolutely not. Uh, when I appeared, the questions were all about how important it is that justice is not only done, seen to be done, but felt like it's being done. And it was made absolutely clear to me, this is, by the way, in a family court, family law context, but the points remain just as good in the criminal law, that there people were not considering that they felt like they were having justice when they were on the end of a telephone, dropping in, dropping out, not being able to see people, not understanding what was being said, then even on video, bad lines, again, unable to read the language, not being there, not feeling at the end of it, that in any sense that they felt uh, that justice had been done. So while Amanda is entirely right to say that one of the solutions to the backlog, one of the solutions to uh, reducing the, the amount of uh, business uh, which is unnecessarily uh, in the courts is to remind ourselves why we have such a face-to-face -face oral evidence system in the first place and it is so that those in the system feel that they're being heard and at the end of it whatever the result that they're sure that justice has uh, been done the figures now in relation to the use of video are of course in one sense very impressive you see that um, in March, some 550 hearings a day being dealt with by video or audio shot up into April, 3,000. But we need to make sure as we emerge from this uh, that we allow data, so we make sure that data and we make sure that technology remain our servants and not in any sense uh, our masters. And we therefore need to be very careful as we emerge from this, that we do not say this has been wonderful. This has been a, a cure to the reason why we had a backlog in the first place. Otherwise, not only will people feel that justice has not been done, but just picking up the point made by Abby. Abby's point, which is a very real one, is that if justice is rushed, then you may find that defendants are going to prison who should not be. But by the same token, the Times a little while ago reported, I have no idea whether it's true or not, that there was a concern out there that defendants who actually should be going to trial and should be going to jail would be coming forward and seeking to obtain deals from courts, which meant that they would be released in circumstances they would not have been beforehand and should not have been beforehand, simply so that we can reduce backlogs. So yes, let's reduce backlog. Let's use technology, but let's not lose sight of what the system is all supposed to be about. Thank you very much indeed. Very interesting to hear somebody talking about justice must be felt to be done. Um, more 
usually we hear about justice being seen to be done. But I think mm. the felt to be done was to me very interesting. In my academic world, there's a great deal written about legitimacy of the system, compliance, and so why people obey the law. And Precisely. this feeling is, I think, very, very important. Thank you. You have thrown open some fantastic questions. We're collecting some lovely questions for answers. Anyone's welcome to answer any of them. Uh, please, panel, don't all feel you have to answer all of them, otherwise the time will go very quickly. But I have to start with Geoffrey Lawrence's wonderful question. Um, thank you, Geoffrey. How do you define criminal justice? And what is the purpose of criminal justice? Perhaps I can turn the question around very slightly and say, well, we all know that justice is about fairness and it's very difficult to have um, fairness in what feels like an unfair society. Criminal definitions, we could get very bogged down. And of course, there are lots of contradictory purposes of criminal justice. My way of perhaps focusing that question a little bit is, have you felt the tensions underlying the purposes of criminal justice particularly strongly in the last few weeks? Who would like to have a go at Jeffrey's question or my version of it? Um, shall I come in there, Nikki? Um, yeah, lovely. I actually haven't felt any tension. I felt, firstly, I think the first thing we need to say is criminal justice. Well, what, what does it achieve? It, it, it's about ensuring the rule of law. It's about ensuring that people conduct themselves in a way that society would expect them to conduct themselves. And it, it's about ensuring that we don't move to a system of anarchy. So I think all of those, I would say, are the, the reasons for it. Have I felt tensions? No, I haven't really felt any tensions. I felt in, in the main that everybody has been understanding of the position all the players in the criminal justice system have been in. Um, and I, I think actually we've come out of this in some ways with a better understanding. Um, it's not perfect. No one would say it is perfect. But on the other hand, um, it's as good, I think, as we've been able to make it in the circumstances. Anyone else want to come in quickly, one of you? Yes, yeah. please. Oh, oh. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I, I would say that I definitely have felt tensions. Um, I know that obviously as a, as a barrister, perhaps, at the stage that we become involved in things is often when things are going wrong and when people really need us to intervene. Um, but certainly I've been quite shocked actually at the experiences that I have had and that I've seen my clients having during this period. To give one example of a particular case that has really stuck with me was uh, right at the beginning of uh, lockdown um, where I had a client who was 12 who was charged with a very serious offence and um, belonged to a household where he had members of his household who were shielding, um, i.e. that could not leave the house because of a particular vulnerability. And I had an officer in the case trying to make my 12-year-old client get into a taxi to attend a police station to be interviewed under caution. And that officer's solution to the fact that that would mean removing him from his family household was that he should therefore find alternative accommodation to shield or to, to be away from his family while they were shielding for the remainder of that 12 week period. And I found that really uh, shocking. And, and again, it, it's that emphasis on trying to get a result, get something done, seeing the uh, unique situation that we're in with the pandemic and not really considering the fact that as Simon has, has raised and, and Amanda's also touched upon as well as myself, that with justice, it's not just about following a process. It's not just about making sure that you're ticking the box of, I have conducted this interview under caution. It's about making sure that you're doing it in a, in a way which is fair, which is accountable, which ensures that people are properly engaged in the process. And I think there really has been, a, a, particularly at the beginning of this, I think it's getting a bit better, but we're still nowhere near where we ought to be. Uh, there really has been this attrition of making sure that everybody is fully involved and fully respected in the systems that we're dealing with. I use, for example, the uh, CVP, the cloud video platform, um, the day before yesterday for a hearing, and it was quite 
shocking the fact that we had defendants who were diving into these hearings, hearings where they were having court dates set, where they were discussing the merits of their case, where they were discussing, in some cases, pleas on shaky mobile phone footage, where they were trying to speak to their lawyers, but they were unable to because everybody else was also on the call. So you had the prosecutor on the call as well. You had everybody else that was waiting for their hearings to be called on. I, my own client couldn't be reached at Felton uh, because of the lack of technology. So we had to do a hearing in his absence. So you see this removal of the involvement of key players in the system, the removal of participation by defendants and witnesses and so on in hearings and in uh, features which are very important to them. So I, I think there definitely is um, a, a loss of uh, equality and a loss of access that we are experiencing during this pandemic. I know that, um, Amanda, you wanted to come in too. I wonder whether I could add to that um, the question which we have from, let me quickly see. Um, Samuel Castlehouse is also directing one directly to you. Will the courts continue to use remote hearings when things are back to normal? Will that assist in addressing the backlog? Uh, if, I, if I may just add to, to the, the first question in this way, I think um, actually both uh, Ian and Abby are right, and if that's possible. And that's to say that there is, there is a tension uh, undoubtedly between the drive to get criminal justice working and making sure that it's doing it properly. I think that has been an issue and continues to be an issue and that's what the rollout of jury trials is trying to address the balance between um, a, a desire on the part of the government and I think it's a, a worthy desire frankly for the criminal justice system not to stop uh, along with any other justice the part of the justice system uh, and and there are undoubtedly moments where recalibration must happen so um, I think what Abby is describing is moments where th there just hasn't been the right balance and the technology actually just isn't there at the moment to enable that and everybody's unfamiliar with it. So I think there are a lot of, um, uh, we're, we're at the very beginning of a very steep learning curve. Um, just, Thank just you very much. Um, I, I, sorry, I'll, I'll, I know, oh, I'll see. I was just pushing on. The flood of questions is coming in. We haven't had any talk about the role of the probation service. So I thought I would choose Jane Donnelly's question here for anyone to comment who's got experience in the courts at the moment. The backlog of court cases in the criminal courts, can it be dealt with in a way that will not lead to impossible operational challenges for the probation service and for prisons? who are of course struggling with social distancing. Does anyone have a comment on the impact of what's going on at the moment in relation to probation? Yes, I, I mean, I think I probably could if, if, if nobody else wants to go. Um, so I think, if, if I can just roll it back a little bit, there's no doubt that the backlog that was already there um, was there deliberately in order to save money at the end of the system. And the, the expensive end of the system is when people are sentenced. Um, obviously, probation is less expensive for the public than prison, but both outcomes are very expensive. And uh, frankly, my view is that the government chose to grow this backlog, not so much in order to save money on courts hearings, but in order to save money at the end of the process. What is happening now is that there is definitely a problem and it's really coming back to things like CVP and access in prison uh, for probation officers to the very limited um, resources um, that are available for them to be able to um, see and uh, have meaningful uh, interaction with people who need their help and who need reports. So uh, absolutely, there is a problem, I think, with um, access um, for the probation service um, and and for their services um, in the pandemic um, and I think the way forward for that is possibly um, threefold one is to increase uh, the CVP provision in, in prisons another is to um, try to put in place measures wherever they may be 
which ensure social distancing and allow the probation service to liaise with those with whom they have to speak, whether it's defendants or people in homes uh, that are coming, you know, that they're going to, to return to, um, and, uh, and really to support the probation service in, the deliver, in being able to deliver their, um, what they need to in order to push things forward. And I suspect actually that there's even more pressure on the probation service because of this desire to try to get through the cases and, and I, when, if I use the word compromise, what I mean is to come to a just result that might not be the one that, for example, the Crown Prosecution Service might have originally been pressing for uh, by way of a contested hearing. So I think there are, it, it, the probation service has a very significant role to play. Thank you very much. Let's give a very specific question to Ian. What's happened to charging time limits? Ian's muted. Could we unmute him? Can you unmute yourself, Ian? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, charging charge, time limits. Charging time limits. I think this has been a real pressure for the police in relation. Let me explain. In relation to summary only matters, have to be charged within six months. Um, and I think the pandemic has caused the police to have to deal with what will be seen as less serious matters much more quickly, rather than worry about the case going over the six month limit. In all other cases, those that are either way offences or indictable only offences, we have seen the use of a release under investigation continues. We've seen bailing continuing um, and no real control over much of that. So what I would say is I think we're seeing the police concentrating more on the summary only offences because they're very conscious of the six month time limit. Thank you very, very much. Um, again, my prerogative as chair, I'm jumping to Emily Wanstall because I think it follows on nicely about the relationship with clients. How has the relationship with clients changed and how have you had to adapt to continue to meet the needs of your clients? It must be fundamental. Um, we need a solicitor's view and a barrister's view. Wow. That's, uh, sorry, the question was climate change, was it? <laughs> no, it wasn't. The question, the question was your relationship with your um, clients. The relationship with the client, I think, it, it's fundamentally important. And I do agree with Abby that we we've got to be very careful that we try and ensure that where I've had clients who said, I actually want you to go to the police station. I want representation at the police station. I have gone. Those cases where I felt they could be dealt with remotely um, and the client has been comfortable with that have been dealt with remotely. And I've been satisfied that actually no injustice has occurred. Um, I don't feel it has affected the relationship in the main with the client. What I do worry about is behind the back door, whether the police are saying to clients, um, well, your solicitor won't come to the police station, so just get on and deal with the interview. We, we've had some instances of being told that, um, and I'll reserve judgment on that, but I do, I do think there is a risk that that will be happening and has happened. Um, so we need, to, we need to look at that very, very carefully. But in the main, I think the, rea the reality is that everybody has understood the dangers of the pandemic um, and has sought to find a way of working around it without really effectively, there will always be instances where there are problems in particular cases. And I think that's down to the solicitor and down to the representative to ensure that in those particular cases, you, you ensure there is no injustice. It, it's not easy to achieve, um, but I do think it's something that we've all, we've all thought about. Yes, um, Simon wants to have a word on the relationship with the client. Uh, yes, to, to an extent, thank you, very, thank you very much, Nikki. To an extent, it was touched on by Abby and her, her earlier remarks. Um, but, but obviously hugely important, if somebody is going to be going through the justice system 
that they know that they can talk freely and easily with their legal advisor. His sense that they consider that actually because of what's happening, remote or otherwise, that somebody's going to be eavesdropping on what they've been saying to their solicitor. Uh, I was talking to a, a court official the other day who, who said that um, in a particular remote hearing, he, he could easily overhear what was being said between the barristers, the solicitors and the client and, and effectively you have to say, sorry, I can hear you. But if you get to a stage where it just becomes awkward or difficult, or you don't feel at ease of being able to talk to your solicitor or barrister, people are going to uh, clam up. And again, getting back to feeling that justice hasn't been done. If people don't feel that they can really comfortably and easily talk to their legal advisor, they're going to stop doing it. So uh, again, I, I'm conscious of this, I'm always sounding like somebody who's always raising warning flags. I'm actually a very positive person within the context of this. You, know, you do need to be very careful that the people who count most in this, the ones who are the victims, the witnesses, uh, and those who are the um, actual defendants in hearings, that uh, they're the ones who we should always be talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Abby's wanting to say something very quickly, Abby, because we've got hundreds of questions. I will. Um, I, I think that uh, for barristers, I think that very often we're actually quite reticent to have too much contact with clients outside of hearings traditionally and what this has really done for us is made sure that we have to be very proactive in reaching out to our professional and to our lay clients so I personally um, there's obviously a difference between how you can interact with clients who are on bail and clients who are in custody but bearing in mind that actually our bail clients are probably the ones who are going to be left waiting the longest before they have resolution of their cases I've now developed a habit of making sure that I'm checking in quite regularly with my uh, bail lay clients um, arranging conferences with my instructing solicitor, whether that's by Zoom, Skype, or even phone call, just to update them on what's happening, even if it's to say, look, nothing's happening, but the reason nothing's happening is because of the pandemic, but we are keeping an eye on your case. If you have any concerns, just you know, make sure that you stay in touch with us. Doing more written advices than I was before, because you have less opportunity to see your clients face to face in the way that you were before, but just so they can see the work that you're doing, because the key is just to make sure that they feel that they are being looked after, that they are being considered. And I, I think actually it's, it, it's, it's in many ways, it's improved my relationship with my professional clients and communicating with them much more regularly um, staying on top of cases trying to identify cases that we can get listed to try to resolve through offering pleas to um, less uh, serious matters uh, through just highlighting to clients that actually the evidence is quite strong they might want to consider um, resolving things and so on um, but I, I think it's all about communication um, as barristers and just making sure that we are keeping everyone informed and engaged in what's happening. And okay. really, to use, I'll be really quick, sorry, Nikki. A really good tactic to use is bearing in mind that your client may not get through to a hearing because of technological issues. It's just talking them through what the hearing is going to involve beforehand and then getting in the habit of making sure that you can have a phone call with them afterwards just in case they missed anything during the course of the hearing, so they feel properly involved and properly informed. Monica Stevenson asks, what do panel members anticipate will be the most significant long-term changes for criminal justice? And I have to say one which has occurred to me is the relationship between solicitor and barrister and client, because with this use of technology, um, there's a risk that Abby's turning into a solicitor, isn't there? Um, who would like to comment on that? Simon. Thank you. I think if I just, probably the right starting point is what it looked, looked to me, and I stress that, what it looked to me when I, when I started my close involvement in the, the, the whole issue, it looked to me that what was happening uh, was that many decisions and many policies were all being adopted and pursued locally, whether you're talking about courts or prisons or police stations, all locally, not in any sense joined up, and that the voice of the really important people, some of the really important people, solicitors and barristers, were not being heard at the beginning. Uh, that it was everybody else would get together and say, don't we think this is a great idea? Uh, barristers, solicitors, this is what we're going to be doing. Not really any thoughts, but this is how it's going to happen. So that's how it started. Uh, certainly my perception, and I hope it's accurate, is that shifted quite dramatically. And that what you're seeing now are 
um, appropriate steps being taken centrally. So HMCTS issuing guidance about safety and security that should come centrally and then be checked that it's being uh, that's applying uh, locally. Uh, that solicitors and barristers are now being much more involved in early decision making rather than as a last to be talked to, and that the regionalisation is working appropriately where those locally are talking with barristers and solicitors about what kind of cases are going to be coming forward. So I would say that as a long-term benefit, if what we have is the right things being done centrally and the right things being done locally, and barristers, solicitors, voices, together with, of course, victims, witnesses, uh, and defendants, that through them are being heard right at the beginning and involved in policymaking, that will be a massive step forward based on my own understanding of what the situation looked like at the beginning. Anyone else with a long-term implication? Let's turn to Lorraine Gelsthorpe's two questions. One is very closely related, the question for Ian, in relation to how can we avoid getting back to normal, where normal means less than ideal after Ian's silver lining in the police station. And the other question, which relates to what somebody else has also asked about the involvement of the public uh, in courts, lay scrutineers of courtroom practices to ensure proper attention to matters, she asks, would it be useful to have some kind of equivalent of lay visitors to police stations in the courts, since it's more difficult for the public to be in public galleries. Um, so I'll, I'm happy to answer the public one, because I think actually looking at the question, she directed it to me. Um, yeah. I think that actually the court system has built into it intrinsically, if we, if we take the pandemic situation away, the idea that the public are supposed to be involved in the process or they're supposed to we're supposed to have as open a system as possible and i think that what's happened with the pandemic is obviously people are quite concerned about physically attending anywhere because of social distancing um what we have seen as a amanda um drew out the best examples really of the thoughtful and best considered um, ways of dealing with the pandemic have been through jury trials the real emphasis has been on the crown court rather than the magistrates court for example so even built into the new social distancing uh, system for jury trials they considered the fact they needed to have a separate courtroom for the media and for the public to sit in. So that's already built in there um, as well. What I would like to see is that sort of um, thought process with the magistrates court, because a lot of these cases that are being directly affected by the pandemic and are being pushed through, as Ian has pointed out, for example, because of the six month custody um, of the six months charge uh, limit, is the, is the summary only matters. And so actually what we, what we really need to do is to encourage people to attend or to, to be involved in magistrates court proceedings, which traditionally they're not really. But there are ways around that. If we get more comfortable with technology, if we increase the use of um, video um, hearings or at least video participation, we could see members of the public participating in hearings via videos. So they could still remain at home but they can log into uh, those hearings in those ways. That, that might be something to think about. Um, but certainly as our social distancing measures improve, then hopefully we will see members of the public attending. I think it's dangerous to try to handpick who from the public you want to attend court. I think the, the default position should just be, if you're the member of the public and you want to attend a hearing, you should be able to whilst maintaining the social distancing measures. How feasible that will be, we'll, we'll have to see. Can I just add that um, I, I know that the Chief Magistrate, because I agree with Abby about Crown Courts, I, I don't think there could have been more um, attention paid to the fact of the need for the press and um, the public to be able to access these courts. And of course the trials that are going on are of great interest to the public at the moment. Um, but if, if one talks about the Magistrates Court, um, they have been absolutely clear that the courts are open to the public um, and of course there are very significant challenges for social distancing in magistrates courts generally uh, but there is um, in principle nothing to stop a an ordinary member of the public from attending i think the question which is do we need somebody else somebody uh, with a particular function to oversee 
what's going on? I'd say not. I would say that the participants um, ought, in, from every area of the courtroom, ought to be in just as good a position in a pandemic um, as the measures are now set out as they were before to ensure that justice is not only done um, and seen to be done, and if I may adopt Simon's um, position, felt to be done as well, um, because uh, actually that's what our roles all entail. And I think what's happened in the very recent past is the learning curve has been so immense that regrettably some things have been lost in the last few weeks, but I suspect that they will um, iron themselves out and the, 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 the new norm in terms of oversight of what is important um, will come back into the frame in, in sharper focus. Thank you. Um, following on from that, Catherine Hurd's question to you, Amanda, is could you give examples of wise and unwise ways that tech solutions could be used to deal with the backlog of cases? Well, if I can, if I can just deal with unwise to begin with, I, I would not want to see technology replace face-to-face -face hearings where they are necessary in the interests of justice. And for my part, um, I, I know that the reason for having three courts in the criminal, in the Crown Court, is to ensure that all of the main protagonists, that's to say, the judge, the jury, the defendant, one barrister uh, or one representative for each side uh, or each party, um, and probably the witness, depending on whether or not it's a section 28 or some other kind of remote um, giving of evidence. But in, in all other circumstances, those are all in the same courtroom. I, I think there's a question to be asked at this point, whether all witnesses need to attend court in the normal way, unless they have special measures. I, I suspect that that, we, that could be rolled out more so that, for example, someone who had to self-isolate would be able to give their evidence remotely um, and should be able to in order for the, for the case to go on. Um, but that aside, I think that it is, generally speaking, not in the interests of justice that everything is done remotely. And that is partly because um, you lose a lot of um, the impact of the way that the, the case pans out if you're not in the same room. And I know that Justice, just to give an example, Justice, the organization, has trialed um, a, a number of trials with the jury being remote. I mean, for my part, um, and, and uh, Jody Blackstock knows this, for my part, I, I just do not think, I think there are very, very significant, and, and for my part, just completely overwhelming challenges to that being a reality. And I, I can spell those out very quickly if you want me to. The, the, the first is that in my view, that a, a jury is a, is a group of 12 random people who don't know each other, who've got no connection, and they build that connection in judging a case together in the same place and by watching each other as much as they are watching everybody else and having a collaborative experience. And however much we on this call are in the same cyberspace, we are not having the same relationship that we would have if we were in the same room. And of course, certainly, and I think I know everyone on this call, but even if I didn't, um, I might be able to build a, a rapport for the purposes of this, but not to judge in a criminal trial, a serious criminal trial. Second reason is uh, to do with um, being able to ensure that the jury is acting properly. And I say that with no disrespect to the jury, but you simply don't know whether somebody else is in the room. You don't know whether they're on their iPad. You don't know whether there's a call coming in or somebody else is also watching it. You just it's very, very hard to police. And we know that even in courtrooms, juries sometimes do things in um, contravention of judges' directions, but at least there is a better chance of being able to, to discover that and deal with it appropriately. And the third thing, and I think, it's a, I think this is actually the slam dunk, is that in order to be part of a jury trial as a juror, you would have, or indeed any protagonist, you'd have to have a quiet place in your home without anybody else there. And that will be, in my view, 
uh, indirectly a, a way of um, sifting out people who will be, in inverted commas, inappropriate for, uh, to, put, to serve on a jury. That cannot be right. That kind of social um, uh, division, if you like, between people who've got enough space in their home to serve as a juror and not have to look after their children at the same time because they're not at school, etc. cetera, um, rather than being able to be part of a jury. So sorry that I rather went on, but I, I do feel very strongly about that. So that is a, a bad, a bad sign from remote um, access to justice, I'd say. Thank you. There's streams of interesting questions. One about whether law students will want to be criminal lawyers, sympathy for judges and magistrates on their working conditions. But I'm going to choose Emil Ali, I think, next, because I think that's a real testing question. Um, could you outline how, if extra funding was granted to the criminal justice system, would it most effectively be utilised to enable the system to function more effectively during the pandemic? Where would you throw money? If somebody gave you more money, where would you chuck money at this moment? Right. Can I come in here? I, Please do. It, it, it certainly should be put into legal aid. Um, there, it's grossly underfunded at the moment. And if you're going to ensure that you have a legacy of lawyers prepared to represent uh, legal aid lawyers, uh, those in custody, then I think you have to put money into legal aid. That's the first thing. I think you also need to look at the court structure. Um, I look at places like Lincoln, where there can be a traveling of 40 miles each way for somebody to attend court. Is it any great surprise that in the afternoon in Lincoln Magistrates Court, they have a higher rate of crack trials than anywhere else in the country because there's no public transport back to the outskirts of Lincolnshire after about 4.30 p.m. So those sorts of things have an effect upon the trial process. But I, I do think that we need to be looking at resources in relation to where the courts are located. We've got to stop this cutting back of courts and we've got to make sure that the public has access to justice, and that means access being able to get to court, as well as ensuring that you have a legacy for legal aid lawyers. Does anyone else want to add to that? What, what I would add is, actually, it might sound as though Ian's talking about um, lawyers, but actually what he's talking about is clients mm. and witnesses. Because actually, if you don't have people who are willing to represent people because the money is just impossible to live on, what you do is you end up with litigants in person and you end up with people who are uh, involved in a more and more difficult criminal justice system. It's incredibly complicated to represent yourself properly uh, nowadays because the law is so complex. Uh, and uh, it's in nobody's interest, frankly, that that happens, that people don't access justice properly because they're in a, uh, incapable for very good reasons of um, representing themselves well. Which is why perhaps Tom Hawker Dawson's question is so good. I was nervous of, um, this is a panel, of course, of lawyers, and he says, what do you think defendants' thoughts on their hearings are at the moment? which my first reaction was, well, we should have a third in this series, which is um, users' voices. But then I thought, well, you lawyers are there to represent the users' voices. So let us end with Tom's question, which is, we can't generalize, of course we can't, every defendant has a different view, but would you like to try and have a final word saying, what do you think your clients would have said had they been sitting on your chair? I, I think, think oh, sorry, go, on, go ahead, Abby. Abby um, and Ian. <laughs> I, think, I think honestly that they would say that they feel that they are slightly forgotten. Um, I think that the, the, the new system itself doesn't centre them. It's something I've said um, throughout this um, webinar. Um, and I think that although I, I, very often we have hearings where we as lawyers and judges and so on think everything has gone smoothly because finally the technology has worked. We've been able to set these dates and so on. 
but actually you have a defendant who sat there quite confused and not quite sure who was talking, who was saying what and what everything meant. You know, we don't have those moments where a defendant can pass a note to you and ask for clarification or can pause and have a, a short conference uh, in the middle of a hearing or short discussion. Um, so I think in reality, defendants are likely to believe that they're being slightly left behind. Uh, but that's where I suppose we have to step in as lawyers and just make sure that we're regularly touching base with our clients, that we talk to them immediately before, immediately after hearings when we're able to and that we put as much in, in writing as we can so that they have something to look back at and to reconsider um, during the course of, of, of hearings. And, and I hope it's something that we continue to, to work on. Uh, they can participate through the uh, CVP, through the cloud uh, video platform, but the technology isn't quite there, I think, to make it. It, it, it's, it doesn't match a face-to-face -face experience in court. Thank you very much indeed. We are inevitably time expired. I'm extremely sorry that I haven't been able to put all the questions and that we haven't been typing answers as we go, but it is impossible, I think, to talk sensibly and write. James Crabb, I'm going to save up your question for next week because I think it's totally relevant to our question of what's going on in prisons at the moment. Um, we do have to end promptly on time, so Thank you for fantastic questions, lots of food for thought. I'm going to save them and think about them, of course. Thank you in particular for the panel who, some of you have made it clear that you're talking too often on webinars. I hope that that wasn't actually true. Uh, I think it's fantastically useful to keep these debates going. I'm very, very grateful to all of our panelists and to all of you who've put the time into attending today. Thank you very, very much indeed. See you next Thursday, I hope, for our second webinar. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.